spirit of the living God. We thank you for your word. We submit to your word. We pray that you would open up the eyes of our hearts. We pray that you would illuminate these words, God. Lord, I confess this chapter to be so mysterious. I pray, God, that you would give us hints of your transcendence, hints of your grace, and that you would provide us understanding. I pray, Lord, that you would provide a focus and a clarity. Thank you, God, that you are faithful. Have your way. I pray, Lord, that we would not dance around this. I pray that we would dance with it. Help us to dance, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So I've been looking at this text this morning or this week and wrestling with this text. This question has been on the forefront of my mind, and I've been asking myself, and I think we should ask each other this, and it's this question, how's your heart? How's your heart? As you reflect on your life right now, or maybe even as you listen to this text, to read this text, how's your heart? Now, I'm not asking you uh, physically, biologically, if you have heart issues, in the scriptures, the heart relates to who you are, the, 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 the soul of all of who you are and, and, and who you belong to. And, 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 and it seems to me, as we're looking at Romans 9, there's this question of, of your heart and our hearts. If you remember, we've been in the book of Romans and we just got to finish to me, the mountaintop of Romans, the highlight, probably the most cherished, if not one of the most cherished chapters in the Bible, Romans chapter 8, when Paul says things like, if God is for us, who can be against us? If, if we are more than conquerors. And oftentimes when we read Romans, we find ourselves kind of on this mountaintop, and if, if it was up to us, we may want to skip chapters 9, 10, and 11 and just get straight to 12, where it talks about being transformed, and, and, and it's much more easy to feel. But yet God, in his providence, gives us chapter 9, one of the most challenging uh, texts right after one of the most life-giving texts that is for us today. And Paul here is writing to the church. If, if you know anything about the context, he's writing to the early church in Rome, Christians in Rome, and at the time, they were predominantly Gentiles. The Jews had been expelled from Rome, and they were being called back in, and there was this predominantly Gentile church, but they were starting to welcome back the Jewish Christians, and they're learning of the gospel. They're learning of the gospel of chapters 1 through 8, that is that we are a people who are not ashamed of the gospel, but we believe in its power to change. And that we are people that believe that we've all fallen short of the gospel, that we've all fallen short of God's glory, but yet it is by faith that we are saved. And it's this call to faith. And there's this question that Paul anticipates and this heart-wrenching reality that he feels of his desire for ethnic Israel. For the people of God in the Old Testament that he'd been following along from Abraham all the way through the prophets. And there's this question that starts to stir up of, is God faithful? If it is only by faith alone, how can we count on God? Did God let us down? Did he, was he not faithful to the Jews? Why is there this new thing that is happening? And really, you see in the first five verses, we didn't read them, but I would encourage you to check them out this week. You see this heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching moment that Paul has. He opens up chapter 9 by saying, I'm speaking the truth. Don't get it twisted. He doesn't actually say, don't get it twisted, but that's my summary. And then he talks about this desire for the people of God, and he says in, in the first few verses that he has this, he would give up his eternal salvation. He would be damned 
if his brothers and his kinsmen could be saved. He says his heart is in anguish, in essence, over their rejection of Christ, over their stubborn hearts. And so we see first in these passages this, what I would call this heart-wrenching reality of rejection. This heart-wrenching reality of rejection. And Paul unpacks this in a few ways through this rhetoric of these question and answer. And the first point that he wants to make as we think about this rejection, as we think about this, this question of has, was, has God let us down? If he's in total control, why did he not come through for all of Israel and all the promises he made to Abraham? And the first point that Paul wants to make is this, that God's surprising, it's all about God's surprising selection and not about entitled election. It's about God's, what I would call, surprising selection and not about entitled election. That word entitled is really important. Look at what it says here in verse 6. Paul says this, but it's not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. He says, as you, as you understand the promises of God, don't get it twisted. Just because you're a Jew does not mean you're of the promise. And then he goes on and he gives an example of the people of God. He talks about Abraham and Sarah and, and how they had two sons. One's name was Ishmael, another name was Isaac. One was the one that God promised, Ish, uh, Isaac. The other one was Ishmael, who Abraham tried to manipulate and help God with his promises. But yet God chose to work his promises out through Ishmael. And then Ishmael has these two sons, Jacob and Esau. And all of their culture would say that if they were to follow the promises of God and his promises to the people, that out of the, of the people of God there would be blessing, that the, the seed would, would bring about the Messiah. As you're following the story, everything points to Esau being the one that it would come from. Everything about, their, about culture, everything even about who Esau was, he was a hunter, he could provide, and Jacob was, was a little surprising. As a matter of fact, Jacob is, is described in the scriptures that I like to call more, about, more of a weasel. He's a jerk. He's not the person that you would think that God would select for his promise, yet if you follow the story of the people of God, there's a surprising selection. It's incredibly surprising. It's almost shocking, God's providence and his selection. This is summarized in verse 13 in this uncomfortable text when Paul quotes back to God's words about Jacob and Esau, and God says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now what's interesting about this is when you hear the word, when you see this hated, this isn't describing what we feel or what we understand by the English word for hated. This isn't so much about a feeling. This is a, a Hebrew idiom. And it relates to loving one more. It relates to selection. It, in, in the same way in the Old Testament, there's this moment when Jacob actually has two wives, a lady, a lady named Leah and Rachel. And it tells us that Jacob loved Rachel and hated Leah. Now, he didn't actually like hate his wife and couldn't stand her. It's more about that he had this, 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 this pure motive, this, this, this selection of Rachel, this priority for Rachel. In the same way, Jesus, in his, and he's talking about following him, he commands his disciples, he says this, he says, to truly follow me, you must hate your mother and father and mother, and you must love me. Now, he's not literally calling us to hate our parents. He's calling us to have this priority. And here, this is a statement of God's selection, of God's surprising selection through Jacob. In addition, what's interesting about this is selection is not what you would think it would be. 
This is why I like the word entitled. Because sometimes people think, oh, we're the people of God. We are entitled to all this prosperity and all this blessing. But truly, when you are selected by God, oftentimes you are actually selected to quite a lot of suffering and discipline. If you follow the story of Jacob and Esau, you will see that Esau actually has a pretty good life. He actually, be, he actually gets a city. He actually has quite a lot of wealth, and Jacob actually goes through quite a lot of struggle. Quite a lot of wrestling. As a matter of fact, you hear the story of Jacob himself wrestling with God himself at one point and walking away limping. There's this famous sermon by a guy named Paul Washer where he, he, he writes about this, and I thought it was really good. He said this. He says, how is it that God demonstrated love towards Jacob and hatred towards Esau? You never see one time God disciplining Esau. Never once, but you do see God beating Jacob every day of his life. When Jacob came back from the land, Esau was so prosperous that he had no need of any wealth from Jacob. But Jacob was limping and broken and had a new name. P.S. We learned at the men's steak night that new name, Israel, means God fighter. (laughs) Wrestler, one who wrestles with God. Why? Because God disciplines his children. This special selection, this sovereign selection Paul's pulling out here. As we wrestle with this, there seems to be this tension of divine sovereignty of, of is God, if God is really in control but yet we're called to have faith, how do divine sovereignty and human responsibility, how can they dance together? It seems like they're stepping on each other's toes. And we have this mystery about this. And Paul here is being sure that as you wrestle with this tension, that you recognize that this is about this surprising selection. Second, as you wrestle with this question, he also wants you to make sure that that you have the right understanding about who God is and what he does. As you feel that that heart wrench of the rejection of those who have rejected God and wondering why God has not went and got them, recognize this. This is about God's compassionate mercy, not Israel's unfair injustice. This is about God's compassionate mercy. It's not about unfair justice. Look at verse 14. I just want to read through this and see what Paul's doing is. And notice in the verbs what God is doing. It says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Is is it not fair that God doesn't have mercy on all people? He says, by no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have mercy. Compassion, little side note, this is a hyperlink back to a moment when Moses is interceding on the people's behalf and he's crying out to God and Moses actually has very similar statements that Paul says and Moses says, Lord, if you would blot out my name from the book of life just to save these people. And God says, that's not your call, Moses. He says, I will have compassion on who I will have compassion on. And then there's this, I believe, this linchpin, this focus here that, that, that he's calling to us to in verse 16. It says, so then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. This is a reiteration of the gospel, right? We've all fallen short. We are all dead in our sins. There's nothing that we can do. We need God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth so that he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Notice here what Paul is doing. What is the definition of mercy? Mercy is not getting something you deserve. 
So if, if this passage is not about unfair justice, if, if we wanted to ask God for justice, what is the justice that we deserve? Condemnation, the wrath of God, that our rejection, that our sin has created. That's the justice that we deserve. Mercy is not getting something that we deserve. If you start crying out, God, it's not fair. God, you must show mercy. That's not mercy, that's obligation. Mercy is to truly give something that is not deserved. And so Paul is correcting our tendency to crying out, and asking for fairness, but true fairness is that we all receive the wrath of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, wonderful preacher, wrote, said this about this. He says, the world fell into sin, but God put a limit, a restraint upon it. And the world would be complete chaos and hell if he did not do so. But the moment he draws back his restraining influence, at any point, there is a hardening there. So that is one of the ways in which God produces hardening. He leaves them to himself. This reminds you of back in chapter one when it says that God let people to their own devices. It's this call. And then he uses Another uncomfortable example, if you've ever been in an Old Testament Bible study, these two, these two passages, Jacob and Esau and Pharaoh, are some of the most difficult passages, and Paul grabs both of those here. You see what he's doing? He's purposely creating a tension in us. He wants us to dance with this struggle. And he uses the story of Pharaoh, and I believe the story of Pharaoh is really interesting. If you remember in the Exodus story, God uses Pharaoh for his glory. He calls Moses to come, and the people of Israel are under captivity, and you have the famous ten plagues. And in those ten plagues, God's, God's instruments for giving freedom to the people, of getting them out of the oppression, of providing deliverance, Pharaoh constantly comes to Pharaoh. And the first four or five plagues, Moses will come to Pharaoh and he, and he says, the Lord says, let my people go. And the scriptures tell us that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. That there was this rejection that Pharaoh did out of his own volition, he hardened his heart. But then at one, in, towards the middle of the plagues, something happens. It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I think this is what Martin Lloyd-Jones is getting after. There's still this hardening of our own hearts, but eventually it's like God just gives us to ourselves, and he lets go of the restraint. It's, it's not about justice. It's about mercy. And finally, as, as we wrestle with this heart-wrenching reality, hear this. This is about God's sovereign purpose, it's not about our finite perspective. It's about God's sovereign purpose, not about our finite perspective. Remember earlier it says, for God works all things for the good of those who have been called according to his purpose, big P, purpose for all of humanity. And really, it's this call when Paul is writing to you and me, and he's basically saying this. Who do you think you are? It's like he's drawing us back, and he's saying, what do you really think about God? Maybe not even who, who do you think you are, who do you think God is? Look at what he does here. It's incredibly convicting to me as I wrestle and dance with this. He says this in verse 19. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault, God? For who can resist his will if he's in control? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? 
Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? It's his call. This reminds me of Job. If you have time, I would encourage you to go read Job chapter 38. In Job, Job is in this profound suffering and he's questioning God and God shows up and basically says this, who do you think you are? Do you, do, and God starts reminding Job about who he is, about his transcendence and his power and his majesty and God never answers Job's question. He never explains to Job the why, he just reminds Job about who he is about God's goodness and his sovereignty and his majesty. And as we dance in this tension, he's calling us to this confession of faith. I love what Tim Keller said in his commentary about this this section, he says this. I don't think Paul is giving us much more than a hint here. But it is, very, it is a very suggestive hint. For the biggest question is, if God could save everyone, why doesn't he? And here, Paul seems to say that God's chosen course to save some and leave others will in the end be more fit to show forth God's glory than any other scheme we can imagine. This may seem strange to us, But that is the point. We are not God and cannot know everything or decide what is best. How's your heart doing? You feeling a little tension as you wrestle with this? You feeling a little discomfort? Seems to me there's a little comfort here coming for us as well. Because here in this text, we don't just see this heart-wrenching rejection. We also see the heart-warming election. Look at what happens here. Right out of this tension, Paul shares what I would call this call to the the believers, this call to, to the saints, this call to the church to be all about as we wrestle with this, as we dance in the tension about enjoying the Lord's presence in this. Look at what he says here. Notice the little switch that goes on here in verses 22 and following. Paul uses some rhetoric here. He actually doesn't really answer this tension fully. He uses two statements where he says, what if? Like, I'm not really sure about this mystery, I'm still human, but what if this is part of the answer to this tension? He says this, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured, circle that word, endured with much patience, vessels of wrath prepared for instruction, destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Who are the instruments of mercy that he's referring to here? If you're a believer, say, that's me. I get to be an instrument of mercy and what do I receive? What does he say? The riches of his glory. What is the glory of God? It's not just in the end, it's also, if we remember back in the Old Testament, it's about his very real presence that shows up in all of these little spots and they experience in the Holy of Holies and we experience in the tabernacle and that Hebrew says, we now experience through the work and person of Jesus. And so there's this call to the believer in this dance to enjoy the Lord's presence in it. But hear this. I believe it's also a call that we are uh, to be enjoying the Lord's presence and also to be dancing in the mystery. As 
we were praying on Wednesday in our teaching team meeting, I felt the Lord just tell me, like, I actually asked the Lord, God, as we wrestle with this, I pray, God, that we wouldn't dance around this. I pray that we wouldn't dance around that Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated and the, the, the Pharaoh's hard heart and the, the tension of that. I pray, Lord, that you would help us, help me, God, to dance with it. And it seems to me that Romans 9 is for us and it is calling us to dance with this mystery. Not to ignore it, not to say, you know what, let's just get to chapter 12. Let's, let's know as a people of God, it's for us. We believe that it will not return void and it has a purpose for us. And right now, God is speaking in some way through it for you and me. Look at verse 24. Look at a, this little taste of the mystery. It says this. I love these two words. I circled them, highlighted them, whatever this is. He says, even us. <laughs> Kind of like last week, God chose me. God chose us, even us. What a privilege. What a surprise. He didn't choose the Esau's. He chose the Jacob's. Even us, whom he has called. He says, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, the all of the people, God's, God's business of, of rescuing humanity, as indeed he says in Hosea, and then he calls back to a prophecy from Hosea that says, those who were not my people, I will call my people. Now we start to see God's sovereignty, that all along the people of God, uh, the Jews, were meant to be an instrument that, that would be a blessing to all the nations. He says, and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Ladies, when you see that, hear this. We have to be the bride of Christ, okay? So you get to be the sons of God here, okay? It's about, it's about this being, having this inheritance. It's, it's a call back to the earlier chapter when we can cry out, Abba, Father. It's this call of election. It's this call of adoption. And so how do you dance with the mystery? I, I'm reminded of a, a, a wedding I went back to a few, a couple years ago. And my daughter, Selah, wanted to dance. And it was really difficult. We were stepping on each other's toes, and, and, and she's really small, and I'm really big, and she can't, she she's ha has a hard time getting around. And at one point, I just picked her up, and we just started to dance. And I pictured this in my mind. It seems to me, as we dance with the mystery, this is the picture I think that we're called to. In enjoying the presence of God, we dance with Abba Father. We don't just dance in the mystery, we dance with God in the mystery. And he comes alongside by his spirit and he helps us. And it's a call into relationship. It's a call to the beloved to know the way that God feels about you. Dancing in the mystery and also hear this, trusting in his mercy. Trusting in his mercy, look at what it says. In verse 29, as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, talking about the remnant, the people of God, we would have all been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. If it had not been for God's mercy, we would all be like Sodom and Gomorrah. And as you think about this, as you wrestle with this, as you think about the, the heart-wrenching reality of those that you know who, who have not yet been drawn to God, who have, not, who, have, who have rejected God, who seem to have stubborn hearts, cold hearts, as you, as you wrestle with this, maybe even a child, maybe even a loved one, I, I want you to hear this, God knows the wrestle. God knows the pain. Jesus himself, when he comes to Jerusalem and he's looking at Jerusalem and he's about to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross for our sins, to give us a way to be adopted, to be brought back, to be, to be 
saved, he says this, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, yet you were not willing. There's still this tension and this call to human volition and human responsibility. And as you wrestle with this, it seems to me we need to go back to this question, how's your heart? It seems to me we could get into all the double predestination and, and all, and all the, the election and all the theology classes. If you love that, I, I encourage you, keep digging into that. Read some of those commentaries that I have listed. There's wonderful conversations, and we should dance in that mystery. But don't miss what Paul is doing here. He is thinking about your heart. He is gut-wrenched over, over stubborn, cold hearts. He is gut-wrenched over ashamed hearts. His, gut, his, his heart is breaking over people who haven't realized that they are not too far gone. Of people who don't realize that God went and got the Jacob. That he selected the most surprising one. He's, he's reminded that yes, some of us may be like Pharaoh and some of the people we know may be like Pharaoh and they have such cold, hard hearts and maybe they're too far gone, but yet think about who's writing this. Paul, who on a road to Damascus is on his way to kill who is on his way to, to drag Christians out of their homes and take them to jail, what happens? Jesus shows up and Jesus says, what are you doing, Paul? And Jesus gets a hold of Saul of Tarsus and what does he do? He makes him Paul. He grabs a hold of his cold, hard heart. And do not miss this, beloved. If you are here today, and you are wrestling with shame, and you say, man, I remember those things I did. How could God love me? I haven't been to church in ages. I haven't opened up my Bible in forever. I don't even know who that Jacob and Esau character is. I don't even know how to pray. I would encourage you to the cold, to the ashamed, stubborn hearts, hear this proclamation, hear this call. You need to believe and you need to receive. You need to believe and receive. This is our heartfelt reflection, believe and receive. In the next passage that we're gonna be looking at in Romans chapter 10, you can see this response. Paul says this. I'll just give you a taste of what's to come. He says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. How's your heart? That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because hear this, beloved. Hear this cold, stubborn heart. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, that God, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved. You will be selected. For with the heart, one believes and is what? Justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. To the heart that feels the shame, hear the tender words of Jesus saying, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In this text, N.T. Wright beautifully summarizes this text. He says, this test, in this text, what counts is grace, not race. This is not about being an entitled people. Hear this to the young man or the young woman who grew up in the church, who grew up learning of these things but has not confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart. You are not entitled. You are not born into this. You must respond. Do not reject the invitation of God. Feel his 
Respond to his calling, profess your faith. Get baptized, make a profession of faith, do that. And second, to the warm but heavy puzzled hearts. Warm, maybe you find comfort in this, but maybe you're also a little heavy. Maybe you have a child or a spouse or a loved one who has that stubborn heart. Perhaps you're a little puzzled by this. It seems to me here Paul is calling you and me together, hear this, to pray and obey. To pray and obey. You notice in the first five verses as Paul has this gut-wrenching, heartfelt response. You'll notice that he finishes up in prayer. Look at verse five. It's not on the screens because I didn't know I was gonna go here. It says this. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. I encourage you as you wrestle with this, as you think on these truths, don't dance around it, dance with it. A few moments, I'm gonna pray. And when I pray, I'm gonna give you an invitation to respond. And then after that, we're gonna have an incredible opportunity to commune with God, to dance with the mystery, to trust him, to pray, maybe for the first time. I've been listening to this song all week. It's called Catch Me Singing. And there's this line in this song that I just wanna sing. I'm not gonna sing it. I'm gonna say it over you says this, you've been God for a long time. You're the final word, you're the finish line. Everything's gonna be all right because you've been God for a long time. I will trust you in the famine. I will trust you in the feast. When I'm standing in your victory, when I'm on my knees, I will praise you with the rising and the setting sun. You're gonna catch me singing when the springtime comes. Let's pray. Spirit of God, I pray, Lord, that right now as we reflect on this chapter, God, we just wanna say thank you. We believe this is for us, and I believe, God, that even right now, perhaps you're using this mystery to call us out of rejection and into reception. And I pray, Lord, for anybody here watching online, for anybody here in this space, whether you've been in the church since you were born, whether this is brand new, if you feel this calling, I encourage you right now to pray this with me. Jesus, I receive you and I believe in you. Jesus, I don't want to reject you. I want... I feel you softening my heart. I feel you doing something. And so from this moment on, not only do I believe in you, I receive you as my Lord and my King, and I understand that you are calling me to live in your ways. Jesus, I repent of my sin. I repent of the evil ways of my tendency towards my flesh and my pride and my ego, and I understand, Jesus, that you're calling me to live in light of your grace. And so I give my life to you. For those who just need to be reminded, pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I trust you. Lord Jesus, I want to dance with you. I want to dance in the mystery that I know you've called me to have some responsibility, that you've called me on mission. You've called me to be one of your chosen instruments of mercy. You've called me to share the good news of the gospel. And I'm not ashamed, Jesus. I believe in the power of your gospel. I submit to your ways, and I follow you, Jesus. Have your way in me. Have your way in my family. 
Have your way in my work. Have your way in my struggle. Have your way in my addiction. Have your way in, in my flesh. Have your way, Lord. And we pray this together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.